Hi, my name's Kelly. I'm a CBT therapist and forensic psychologist. And today I wanted to do a short presentation about working with problematic personality traits and using CBT. So I'm just going to share my screen. So as I mentioned, I just really wanted to talk about how we can use CBT when using and working with problematic personality traits. So within understanding personality, we have, everyone has a personality, we all have it. It's how we think, how we understand working with other people, how we understand interacting with other people, how we experience emotions within ourselves, how we're able to express our emotions and also how we interact with other people. And often we align ourselves with our personality that we'll say, oh, we do things because of our personality. And then we have personality traits. So these are the patterns of those characteristics. So whether that is patterns of thought, whether that is patterns of how we express our emotions or react to certain situations. And personality traits can be relatively stable over, over a period of time. And then we have personality disorders. So these are when our traits become really quite apparent, where they can become quite rigid. So, so almost difficult to, to change, but not impossible. They are definitely possible to change, but they are more rigid. And they're not always that helpful. So they can impact upon our ability to make and maintain relationships, whether that is friendships, romantic relationships, um, working relationships, and sometimes they do impair our ability to be able to, to work, to, to gain employment, to maintain employment. And with these, the kind of the, the different maladaptations that it can cause distress in, in people that experience them. And then that is kind of really what we want to look at when we're thinking about CBT. We're looking at personality disorders. However, that within research that we're moving away from using the term of personality disorders because we know it can be quite labelling. So it's about thinking about those, those problematic personality traits, so those difficult personality traits. But when we are thinking about the, the concept of personality disorder. These are the three main things that we want to think about. So they, this is three Ps. So they need to be pervasive, problematic and persistent. So what that means is that those personality difficulties, so those traits need to be present for a person um, and they need to be what was maybe called outside the, the norm. So they need to be more extreme than just say um, someone that say oh it's just my personality but they need to cause difficulties for the individual or, or other people around them so they need to be problematic they need to to cause some problems but then within that they need to be persistent so they normally emerge in, in adolescent or earlier adulthood and they are as i said with, with that rigidity and they need to be relatively inflexible but stable and persistent into later life but in the UK when we're thinking about the the chronic chronicity of it that we would generally assess for personality disorder once an individual is over the age of 25 as research has shown that that is when your personality has fully developed so even though they may be emerging in the adolescent period or early adulthood that it isn't until the age of over 25 or, or over that we would kind of really if we wanted to to do do a, like a formal assessment and they need to be pervasive so what that means is that it needs to go over a wide variety of areas of someone's life and they need to cause some sort of distress or make it difficult to to function in certain areas so again that could be in someone's personal life it could be in their work life it could be with romantic partners it could be with family partners um, and it could even be into offending behavior 
But these are the three P's that we need to consider if we're thinking about problematic personality traits or, as I said, personality disorder. But as I said, be, be aware of the kind of the impact of the label that can be received by, by some people. Some people find it helpful to have a diagnosis of personality disorder, whereas other some people find it quite labelling to have that diagnosis. So just being aware of that. So we've got the three P's. And then if we're thinking about moving this over into to CBT, I just want to share one of the, the models when we're thinking about formulation and to understand problematic personality traits. Within CBT, we use formulations a lot and formulations are maps of an individual or it could be maps of a particular problem. It could be maps of a diagnosis. So if we're looking at, again, thinking about personality disorder, this is from um, Davidson in 2008. So this is a formulation that can explain someone's experience. So first of all, you really want to look at those background factors. So remember that when you are doing a formulation, it's best practice to do it with the individual who you are formulating because they're the expert on, on their life. We're merely professionals to, to support them with the understanding. So you want to look at those background factors. So anything that's happened in this person's upbringing throughout their life that has impacted upon how they are feeling in this moment, how they're experiencing their life. So as you can see by this example, that there are things that happened in the childhood, so told by a mother that she should have been a boy, the parents favoured brothers and sisters, um, not as able, able academically as siblings. So you've got all of those things that have happened in an individual's upbringing, so that childhood and adolescence. So thinking about the critical period, so up until the age of seven, but also into the adolescence um, developments so into the teen years. And as you can see with the arrows, that those background factors impact upon someone's core belief. So how they see themselves and how they see others. And how I like to conceptualize core beliefs is that if you imagine a tree, and you've got your core beliefs are the roots of a tree. Then you have the, the trunk of the tree. So they're your rules and then your, your assumptions. So rules can be statements such as um, I should do this. I shouldn't. I must. I mustn't. If I do this, then dot, 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 dot. Or if this happens, then dot, 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 dot. And those rules and assumptions then feed into the top of the tree. So all the branches and the leaves that are your thoughts, that kind of that narrative, that voice that we have um, continually narrating on what's going on in our life or how we understand different situations. But the core beliefs are what sit at the roots and those core beliefs filter through all the areas of the tree. So as you can see here, those background factors have influenced those core beliefs. And the core beliefs are, again, if we're thinking about personality traits, they can be quite rigid, but just because they're rigid doesn't mean that they're unchangeable. So you can see that I am no good, I don't deserve to be happy. And the core beliefs about others, so nobody could love me, other people can see how bad I am. Not included in this formulation, but we also have core beliefs about the world in general. So the world is dangerous, the world is unsafe. So that's kind of ex exploring, expanding your core beliefs from yourself, others, and then the world in general. And with the core beliefs, you can see that the arrows, they feed into each other, but they also feed into kind of looking at what is that current problem for the individual? So often this is what an individual is potentially coming to therapy for or what they're seeking out support from. And they're the things that we can often see quite apparently. Um, so you can see here those examples of self-harm, losing job, difficulty, structuring time. So they give us a real clear, potentially goals of what we could work on within therapy. And then with the arrows, you can see that there is that kind of interactional relationship between the core beliefs, the current problems, but also those emotions. So what emotions is a person experiencing? So this person is experiencing sadness, anxiety and anger. And how does that link into, are they feeling quite angry? Because they they believe that no one could love me. So why do other people get to experience love? Or why can't I have that? And that can be then if we look up to the current problems, someone could be eating and drinking to success to maybe to, to manage that anger or even thinking about sadness to fill that hole. So you can see how they're all starting to interrelate. 
And then when we go from the emotions, you've got the underdeveloped and the overdeveloped areas. So the overdeveloped areas are the things that are maintained throughout their life. They're reinforced. It gives, this could be reinforced by others, be reinforced by themselves. And they're often maintained throughout adolescence, childhood and into adulthood. But those overdeveloped areas are often developed to help an individual. They're, they're serving a function, but they are overdeveloped in the sense that the underdeveloped behaviours aren't given a chance to develop because you've got all of these overdeveloped behaviours. But those overdeveloped behaviours help an individual to cope. Without them, they may be struggling even more. So then you look at the undeveloped areas and you can see that there is almost quite a clear comparison. So the self-defeating and punishing behaviour versus being able to nurture themselves, being able to care for themselves, show themselves compassion. And what really we want to do and how you would translate this formulation into therapy is thinking about focusing on those underdeveloped behaviours. How can I help someone to develop those behaviours? Because if we're able to develop the underdeveloped behaviours, the overdeveloped behaviours are going to decrease. And that is just a really simple way of, well, it's simple when it's written down, but not always to, to, to write it, but it's about using a model like this to help an individual understand what are the, the problematic personality traits, but how has that developed? Often when people develop a personality disorder or problematic personality trait, personality disorder traits, they have experienced a lot of things in their life that have been really, really difficult. So they've had no choice but to develop those overdeveloped behaviours to be able to survive. And I think that's a really important part that when we are looking at this area or this, this diagnosis, that it is often because of what an individual has been through. So it's not what's wrong with you, it is what has happened to you and how can we support you to be able to, to work through and improve your life into a life that you would like to live. So that's just a, a really tiny snapshot in, into personality disorder, problematic personality traits and how you can use CBT can, to conceptualise it. So I hope you found that helpful. Please check out my other videos on here where I talk about CBT skills, forensic psychology, a whole other heap of information. And please let me know in the comments anything else you'd like me to cover. Thank you.